The 1968 Democratic National Convention is considered one of the most pivotal events that took place within the turbulent 60s. The events that unfolded in Chicago that year not only shocked the nation, but also the world. However, in order to fully understand the developments that took place, we must look at what circumstances led up to the convention, what happened during the convention, as well as the effect those events had on the nation in the days that followed. Welcome to Chicago, 1968. 1968 was a very violent year. To begin with, Martin Luther King was assassinated as well as Robert F. Kennedy, and the Vietnam War continued to be a hot topic in American society. Lyndon B. Johnson stunned the world by saying that he would not run for another term as president. Following this stunning announcement, Richard Nixon was nominated as the Republican candidate for president. Around the same time, Hubert Humphrey emerged as a top candidate for the Democratic nomination. What has Richard Nixon ever done for you? What has Richard Nixon ever done for me? Uh, Medicare. No, that was Humphrey's idea. But Nixon, Nixon. Or the bomb, the nuclear bomb. No, that was Humphrey's idea to stop testing the bomb. But Nixon... Well, what has Richard Nixon ever done for me? Uh, let's see. Working people, I'm a worker. Nixon ever do anything? No. Humphrey and the Democrats gave us Social Security. But Nixon? Nothing in education. Nothing in housing. He hasn't done anything there either. The preceding has been a paid political announcement by Citizens for Humphrey Muskie. That's funny. There must have been something Nixon's done. Following Martin Luther King's assassination, riots broke out across the country, including in Chicago. Mayor Richard J. Daley made his stance clear by stating, Shoot to kill any arsonist or anyone with a Molotov cocktail in his hand because they're potential murderers and to shoot to maim or cripple anyone looting. Vietnam protesters were not deterred, however, and both the SDS and the Yippies were waiting for something bad to happen to strengthen their campaigns. Violence eventually erupted on August 28, 1968. This became a day that is known by many as a police riot, as police officers and a new political group, the Youth International Party, also known as the Yippies, battled it out in the streets of Chicago five miles from the convention hall at the International Amphitheater. This political party was formed December 31, 1967 by past STS members Abby and Anita Hoffman, ex-Berkeley activist Jerry Rubin, Nancy Kirshen, and Paul Krasner, who is the editor and publisher of the magazine The Realist. However, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin are often seen as the founders and leaders of the political party, despite the party having no actual leader. Their political group was a much more reckless and violent side of the leftist movement. They were strong advocates of street violence and drugs, with Abby Hoffman even being quoted yelling at the protest, we will burn Chicago to the ground. We demand the politics of ecstasy and acid for all. They believed that this street violence was the only means of bringing change to the government and civil organizations. In addition to this violent approach towards social changes, the Yippies also used many other comedic tactics to gain attention towards their causes, such as gathering followers to help levitate the Pentagon building and being tried at the HUAC, also known as the House of Un-American Activities Committee, with Jerry Rubin wearing different costumes such as a Revolutionary War soldier, a Viet Cong soldier, and Santa Claus, each time he and Abby were tried. As a Revolutionary War soldier, he passed out copies of the Declaration of Independence to those that attended and blew large bubblegum bubbles as his co-witnesses taunted attendees with Nazi salutes. The Harvard Crimson wrote an article about the HUAC antics saying that, In the 50s, the most effective sanction was terror. Almost any publicity from HUAC meant the blacklist. Without a chance to clear his name, a witness would suddenly find himself without friends and without a job. But it is not easy to see how in 1969, an HUAC blacklist could terrorize an SDS activist. Witnesses like Jerry Rubin have openly boasted of their contempt for American institutions, a subpoena from HUAC could be unlikely to scandalize Abby Hoffman or his friends. This group of founders met together to drop acid when they thought of the idea to create a rock festival in Chicago that would also be a political demonstration without being so boring. They would call it the Festival of Life. 
They went through this plan and applied for a permit for the Youth Festival in Chicago with the goal of bringing 100,000 young adults. The permit was denied by the city, but the Yippies still determined to demonstrate, decided to go through their plan anyways. They even brought along their own presidential candidate, a pig named Pegasus. When asked how much money he would accept to stop the protest, Abby Hoffman stated, A hundred thousand dollar rent. I don't understand the rent. You mean to, to take, to rip, the, rip off this city for a hundred grand? See, it's, it's, a, it's a groovy thing to do. <laughs> what, are you kidding? What are they going to do with it anyway? Would you have done it? What? You have taken a hundred thousand dollars to call everything off. I would have taken a hundred thousand dollars for calling it off. <laughs> well, well, how much is it worth to you to call it off? Call off a what? Million? Would you have done it for a million? Revolution? Yeah. What's your price? My life. Soon, protesters and police began preparing for Chicago's Democratic Convention. On January 2nd, Dick Gregory, a black comedian and civil rights activist at the time, announced that he would come to Chicago in August to organize and lead protests and marches before and during the convention in an attempt to compel the city to enact a better fair housing ordinance, as well as addressing other civil rights issues going on in the city at the time. The protesters were coming in with a passion for change and the expectation to be heard. Rennie Davis, project director for the National Mobilization Committee to End War in Vietnam, one of the most influential groups of protesters, spoke out against the battered U.S. political system and the goals for protesting the convention. Many of our people have already gone beyond the traditional electoral processes to achieve change. We think that the energies released are creating a new constituency for America. Many people are coming to Chicago with a sense of new urgency and a new approach. On August 4th, protesters of all kinds of political and philosophical ideologies came together behind a pressing and passionate cause, ending the increasingly unpopular and taxing war in Vietnam. There were a total of 10,000 protesters. Thousands of demonstrators piled themselves into Lincoln Park. Denied the permission to spend the nights there, police moved in each night to break up the demonstrators, sometimes resulting to physical force and tear gas to break up the crowds. The paranoia of what horrors might unfold at the convention crept deeper into the minds of the people of Chicago as the police publicized reports that the protesters were planning to slip LSD into the city's water supply. I want you to start singing. Come on. And it's one, two, three. It was evident that Mayor Daley had intended to make Chicago appear a warm and welcoming center for the convention to take place, plastering posters of trilling birds and blooming flowers around the avenues leading up to the convention, as well as redwood fences. But the underlying intentions of Daley for the convention were unmistakable. The main doors to the convention, designed to look like the White House entry, was bulletproofed. The International Amphitheater itself was surrounded by barbed wire topped steel fencing holding within them an abundance of security guards and armed policemen. Chicago was bubbling with anticipation for full out chaos, ready to boil over. If you're coming to Chicago, be sure to wear some armor in your hair, Mayor Daley said as he prepared for over 12,000 police officers, 6,000 National Guard members, and 6,000 Army troops. A total of 22,500 men in uniform, all the combat, half of that present for protesters. The Tribune even reported the convention site to be a veritable stockade, commenting on the presence of such heavy security surrounding the convention. Over 10,000 anti-war protesters gathered to show their support for ending the war in Vietnam. Together, the Yippies, the SDS, and another group called the National Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam led a massive demonstration. Chicago Mayor Richard Daley, in response, deployed 23,000 police officers and National Guardsmen to control the protesters with orders to shoot to kill if necessary. Daley kept repeating to reporters that, no thousands will come to our city and take over our streets, our city, our convention. Tension began to build between the two opposing sides. Finally, the tension was broken. At approximately 3.30 p.m., a young man lowered the American flag at a legal rally taking place at Grant Park Police broke through the crowd and began to beat the boy as other protesters threw food and rocks at the officers. Violence exploded as police officers and protesters began to fight with each other as chants could be heard from the protesters of, 
Hell no, we won't go, and pigs are whores. The protesters eventually made their way out of the park and into the streets so that blood was spilled, it was spilled in the city. Tear gas was thrown as an effort to control the crowd. So much was thrown that it began to even spread inside of the convention center. This ensuing riot became known as the Battle of Michigan Avenue. Protesters began forming human chains to chase away the police officers, but in return were just beaten to the ground with clubs and tear gas. Eventually the demonstration made it to 11 p.m. where police were ordered to force the protesters out of the park because it was past curfew. Many protesters applied for permits to sleep in the city's parks, but the city and Mayor Daley once again denied these efforts to keep the demonstration going, causing the protesters to have to break the law in order to remain there. This gave the excuse for Mayor Daley to authorize the use of clubs and maces that had been being used before. Protesters shouted, the whole world is watching, at the police as they were beaten and arrested. But indeed, the whole world was watching, as broadcasts of the event live could be seen from all over. In the end, nearly 600 people were arrested, and hundreds were injured in the Battle of Michigan Avenue. And with George McGovern as President of the United States, we wouldn't have to have Gestapo's tactics in the streets of Chicago. With George McGovern, we wouldn't have a National Guard. hard it is to accept the truth. Who is not a check with our state chairman? He's an elected delegate. What are you trying to strong arm stuff? He's an elected delegate. You are. Check with the delegate. Where are the rules that say we must show him every minute? Who the hell are you? Are you the one they're trying to throw out? Yes, I am. Why are they trying to throw you out? I object to their behavior. I beg your pardon? I object to their behavior. Secret Service, push! He's an elected official. They're shouting Secret Service, push here. Mayor Daley defended his police tactics by stating this. In the heat of emotion and riot, some pl policemen may have overacted, but to judge the entire police department by the alleged action of a few would be just as unfair as to judge our entire 
younger generation by the action of this mob. I would like to say here and now that this administration, our administration, and the people of Chicago have never and will condone brutality at any time, but they will never permit a lawless, violent group of terrorists to menace the lives of millions of people, destroy the purpose of this national convention, and take over the streets of Chicago. Nixon used the convention to help his election campaign with many ads. It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Using these tactics, Nixon obviously became the next president. The Democratic National Convention of 1968 made a huge impact on the Democratic Party, Chicago, and America in general. The next time a convention was even allowed to be held in Chicago wasn't until 1996. In the end, about 650 protesters were arrested, even though most of the violence was from the police. In the words of Daly, the policeman isn't there to create disorder, the policeman is there to preserve disorder. In the end, the Yippies didn't get exactly what they wanted, as Humphrey was still chosen to represent the Democrats in the next election. Although he was elected, they were still successful in their goal of preventing a Democrat from winning the presidential election. Welcome to the...